All right, so I have to admit, I was a little bit scared putting together this sort of talk. And I'm going to try the best I can to answer this question, but really what I'd hope to do is provide you with a way to answer it for yourself. Hopefully this won't turn into a religious talk. I'm not going to tell you that there's one true right way, and I hope that you agree with me that Ruby is diverse enough where we don't need one true right way. This also won't be a super scientific talk, so if you're looking for hard numbers on various different aspects of things, you might be getting something different than what you expected. Really, it's a talk about choices, both choices that I've made and choices that we as developers will need to make moving forward working in Ruby. I'm definitely not a fortune teller, so please do not come to me a year from now and tell me that I was wrong about some of these things. I know I will be. I'm also not a language implementer, and up until maybe a couple months ago, I didn't really know anything about language design. So please don't fight with me over who has the fastest Fibonacci sequence. It's not really that sort of talk. Instead, what I'd like to focus on is a few stories about things that I've actually had to deal with in projects of mine. Now, the most well-known project of mine is Prawn. How many people have heard of or used that? OK, great. So Prawn is interesting as a case study of Ruby the language, because we decided from the get-go that we were going to develop it on Ruby 1.9. And this was before Ruby 191 had come out. And we decided we wanted to make sure to keep Ruby 1.8 support at, you know, at all times. We didn't want it to break. It would be considered a bug if it did. So there's some interesting things there to talk about. Another interesting thing was the decisions I needed to make when writing this book. It'll be out in a few weeks. I think O'Reilly may have given you all free rough cuts access or something like that. So you might want to check that out. But if you think about it a year ago, deciding whether you're going to talk about Ruby 1.8 or Ruby 1.9 was a non-trivial question to answer. I'll also talk a tiny bit about stuff that I've been doing in my commercial work, uh, because even though I tend to do a ton of open source stuff, it actually turns out that I just work for a really understanding company. And that makes me run into some interesting problems, for sure. So a lot of this is going to be about forks in the road, where you have to decide where to go, and your decision is going to really affect the way that things go forward in your projects. So I'd like to start with Prawn. Now, with Prawn, we were trying to build a PDF library that would be faster by a lot than PDF Writer, uh, that would support multilingualization so that people can use internationalized text in their documents. And that would also allow people to be very expressive about the way that they built up their documents. You know, we wanted to make something that was pretty to look at, for sure. So at the time, the promises of Ruby 1.9 seemed obvious. After all, it is made out of cheetahs that speak every language. And they are blessed by a magical wizard with magical features. But at the same time, I was writing Prawn because I needed to replace PDF generation in existing software that I had. And 100% of that software was running on MRI on Ruby 1.8.6. So that means that despite the fact that Ruby 1.8 is slow, that it's a little out of date, it's still sort of like that old pickup truck that is just a workhorse. You know, it, it may have a little rust, it may be a little bit dated, but it's done a lot of good work for us and we can't just get rid of it. As it turned out, you're looking at about 80 or 90% of the work that it took to take Prawn, which was written on Ruby 1.9, and bring it back to Ruby 1.8. Now, this is a little bit of smoke and mirrors because we planned this you know, in the first place. We intentionally used things that made it so that it ran on both systems. But I'd like to talk a little bit about how this sort of thing works and how you can do this in your own projects if you wanted to support across versions. 
So one thing that's great is that if you have a greenfield project, you know, something you're just starting off from scratch, is that actually getting it to run on Ruby 1.9 isn't that hard. But it's also not something that's going to be automatic. For example, not only will this not work correctly on Ruby 1.9 just to try to print out some Unicode text as seen exactly here, it won't even parse you'll get a message saying that you know, there's an invalid multi-byte character or something like that. And the fix for this is easy, which is that every file, every source file that you write needs to have a magic comment saying what encoding that file is in. Now, this may seem like sort of tedious you know, bean counting, but it actually gives some benefits that we can look at. Of course, this is entirely to support the uh, M17N framework so if you look at the situation on Ruby 1.8, strings are essentially sequences of bytes and nothing more. It's possible to do character-based access and manipulation, but you need to work around it. But on Ruby 1.9, it's the opposite. You're working with characters, and if you want to work with bytes, you need to be specially aware of that. Now, the interesting consequence of this is that even if you firmly believe that your application need only be written in and speak American, if you're doing any sort of binary manipulation, you need to be aware of this. This could be as simple as something as loading in a image file and playing around with it. So when you're dealing with any strings or I.O. objects that are binary data, you need to be explicit about it so that Ruby doesn't look at the default external encoding for your files based on the, actually is based on the locale on your file system unless you explicitly set it. Um, so it doesn't look at that and apply that to your binary data. Uh, I was having all sorts of weird bugs and problems. I didn't realize about this situation existed, but it was because it was trying to interpret some of the files that we were working with as if it were UTF-8. And because Ruby 1.9 is smart about these things, it knows how to validate encodings which means that if you have a binary string that doesn't, contains invalid Unicode characters in it, you know, it's interpreting it as Unicode, it will cause problems when you try to run your code. So if you look here, the idea is fairly simple. If you want your code to work the same everywhere, you have to be explicit about the encoding that the file is in. So for text files, that means setting the character encoding. For binary files, it means either using bin read or when you open the file using the B flag. Now, I know that this is something that people used to think, unless my software needs to run on Windows, it doesn't matter. But this is actually two issues in one. It's not just the line feed issue. It's now an issue of how Ruby 1.9 will interpret that code. So everyone needs to be aware of the fact that you need to pay attention to when you're dealing with binary files on Ruby 1.9. The interesting side effect is that if you mostly develop on some sort of Unix, uh, it'll be easier to catch bugs related to this before you release your code, and this will make Windows people happier. So the multilingualization is really the thing that's going to get in your face when you start working with Ruby 1.9. And sort of as a consequence of this, among other things, you no longer can treat a string as an enumerable. So you no longer can just map across lines or do things like that. You have to be more explicit. So that means either using some of the enumerators that are available or some of the iterators that are available. And this just means telling Ruby what you want to work with, either lines or bytes or characters. And once you get in the habit of doing this, it's not really that hard to you know, do at all. So, these are the things that when I first set out to start working on 1.9 with no previous experience at all, except for you know, blog posts telling me about all the cool features that would be in 1.9, these are the things that really impeded me from developing. I could not continue to develop Prawn until I learned about the existence of these features. Now, it depends on whether you're trying to build something just for 1.9 or if you need backwards compatibility. But what you should be aware of is that certain things are new syntax features in 
Ruby 1.9. And if you decide to use these, backporting becomes more complicated because you can't simply isolate these things depending on what version they are. You would need to isolate them on a file level and make sure that they don't get loaded so that they don't get parsed on Ruby 1.8. Otherwise, your code won't run. So now what I'd like to do is take this general idea of how you can get started with Ruby 1.9. And I really think that this is enough just to get your code to run there. And then you can start playing around with new features and things like that. I think this is enough for you to get something running on Ruby 1.9 today if you wanted to. But the question is, what if you don't have a Greenfield project? What if you have a side project that you'd like to see how it works on 1.9? Well, you can use the same ideas that I just talked about, but you need to approach it in a little bit of a different way. So right now I'm going to just go through a very rough process of how you take Ruby 1.8 code and go to 1.9. This is actually what we did in Highline, uh, which is a command line interface library. First of all, you need to make sure that your coverage is decent. You can use a tool like Rcov to do this, which works on 1.8. It doesn't work on 1.9, but the important point is before you start to migrate your code, you have to make sure that you have tests for it. Otherwise, it's going to get really ugly when you're starting to make these sort of you know, implementation level changes and things. And this is sort of common sense, but it's also something that is easy to forget. And it's going to create problems when you don't know whether it's because you introduced the bug or because you're doing something wrong on 1.9. So if you want to bring something up to speed, get your test up to speed first. Now in Prawn, especially because Prawn is something that's a little bit difficult to test, because we're dealing with very complex output that generates these PDFs. And we have a great library, PDF Reader, that can help us analyze that stuff. But I mean, I'll be honest, we don't test every single feature that we write because if PDF Reader doesn't have support for it, then that means we have to write parsers for these things. So what we did is, you probably can't see this code, but it's not that important. Just look at the example on the right. We made a bunch of examples, a whole bunch of them. And then we made a rake task to automate these examples, and we made it so that it would make sure that when the errors happen, it would catch those things and tell us what was breaking and things like that. So if you're taking code from 1.8 and going to 1.9, I feel like this is invaluable to have. If it's a Rails app, this might be as simple as setting up some sort of you know, fitness testing of some sort. But if you've got a library or a script, just write up some use cases and then make sure you hammer through them as you're working on this stuff. It'll really help you catch subtle errors that your test might not. So once you have these two things in place, you sort of have a, a support framework for beginning to experiment. My suggestion at this point is that, you know, whatever revision control system you're using, create a branch dedicated to Ruby 1.9 stuff, and then just hammer on it until the test pass. And at this point, don't use new syntax, don't worry too much about new features, but don't worry too much about making the stuff work on Ruby 1.9 and 1.8 at the same time. Just get the tests to pass and the examples to work on 1.9. Then ask yourself whether you plan to support 1.8 in the future. Now if you have an open source project, this might be a more sensitive subject. But if these are scripts that you have running on your computer or you know, something that you have for a client and you've pretty much got a complete project done and you have everything you need, you may not need to continue support for 1.8. Believe me, as a developer that's maintaining parallel you know, implementations across versions, even when it's not that bad, it's still a major burden to think about supporting my software across different versions. And the reason for this is that once you do that, you're heavily constrained on what you can do. You can't take advantage of new features because if you do, then there's more code that you need to isolate. So, Think about it long and hard once you get your stuff working on 1.9, whether you care about 1.8. Of course, like me, some of you may really want to keep that workhorse around for some of your projects. And now the process is pretty straightforward. You get your tests to run on 1.8 without breaking on 1.9. Now, with the case of Prawn, we were very specific about the versions that we support. We only work with Ruby 1.8.6 and Ruby 1.9.1. And other versions may work, but we don't support them. 
So for us, it was just a matter of running rake and rake19 on our tests whenever we do these things. But you should also look at Zentest for the multi-Ruby utility. Now this is really cool. It allows you to basically have as many Ruby versions as you want running concurrently against your test. So that's a really cool way of doing this because it'll tell you right away when something breaks, even if you're not using those in your day-to-day -day work. You know, these will be installed in a sandbox that you don't need to worry about. So it's a really cool tool and it's pretty easy to use. So if you want to have parallel version support and you want to do more than what we did in terms of supporting different versions, that's probably the way to go. So what I suggest is rather than trying to come up with ugly hacks to make something work on 1.9 and 1.8, maybe if the features are easy to backport selectively, you might as well just do that. Because then, at some point or another, if you want to end your support for an earlier version of Ruby, you don't need to break down different versions of the software. It's already written to meet a certain specification. Now, you'll notice here that whenever it's possible, we try to do this in a safe way. You know, we check to see if the things already exist so that it doesn't conflict on different implementations or different versions and things like that. And I wouldn't suggest doing this for anything super fancy. But if your needs are really simple like this, go for it. Now, another thing that you might want to do is if you are using checking the actual version numbers, you might want to create a utility that helps you selectively run blocks of code based on what version you're working with. Now, this just helps clean things up a whole lot. And it makes it so that if you want to change the way that these things work internally, the levels of versions that you support and things like that, you could do that in one place instead of every single place you do this within your application. Uh, the underlying idea here is that if you're backporting a 1.9 library to 1.8, Try to isolate those changes that you made so that they can more easily be seen by other people who are using your software or by you, and so that those changes are in one place so if something breaks, it's easy to fix. And hopefully, if you do these things, you'll be back to greener pastures again. And this is sort of the experience that I got out of Prime. And what I'm hoping that you can take away from it is the first set of things tell you, okay, if you do these things, you could start just hacking on little scripts and things like that, whatever you want on 1.9. Try it out. I, did, I specifically didn't talk about what new features they are. I didn't talk about how fast it's going to be because most of that stuff is going to really depend on what you're doing. In the case of Prawn, if you're doing a bunch of image embedding, Yarv is super, super fast for that because it's just a bunch of number crunching and you know, basically doing pack and unpack. But if you're doing a bunch of text and you need to transcode from different encodings, it's slower than MRI. So just keep this in mind that moving to Ruby 1.9 is not going to be a magic bullet, but that it may well work really good. And in other situations, I've seen clear advantages. And I, I think that the best way for you to find that out is to do it yourself. So. That basically wraps up what I'd like to say about just the idea of moving to 1.9 and trying it out. Please do try it out. I mean, play with it for a few minutes and see if you like it. If it seems promising, spend a day on it. Make it one of your side projects. It's important for you to at least know what's out there instead of relying on what other people are telling you you should do. So now I'd like to talk about the idea of writing a book a year ago about what versions of Ruby you should be using. You know, by choosing to make Ruby best practices 1.9 only, that's a vote of confidence in Ruby 1.9 as the way forward. But the interesting thing is that this didn't come from my book. I did some technical editing for David's books. David's here, so. Uh, he was the one that actually brought up an issue to me that I didn't really consider before. And this issue was, if you're going to talk about Ruby 1.8 at this point, what does that mean? Now, it's pretty easy to draw a clear line in the sand between Ruby 1.8.6, which is our workhorse, our old 
software that does a great job of running all of our legacy software. I mean, who has written code on MRI for Ruby 186 in here? It should be 100% of you, right? Okay, so obviously we know what that is to a certain extent. We have a feeling of what Ruby 1.9 is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this magical future car that brings us to Ruby awesomeness, right? So, but the question remains, if that's the case, what the hell is Ruby 187? Okay, so I'll do my best to answer this quoting directly from the sources. So the core changes from 186 to 187 in which a method signature either had an addition to it or it was a new method entirely looks something like this. Okay, those are the core changes. Did you get all of that? <laughs> okay, so the standard library was a little bit more conservative. Okay, so there's a reason for this. Does anyone know what all of that stuff is? Yeah, it's code, but I mean, where, where did these functions come from? Right, the Ruby 1.9 back, backports, which in theory seems sort of cool because you know, I just spent the first 15 minutes of this talk telling you about how you're going to need to have a baseline understanding of internationalization to use Ruby 1.9, and I can imagine people saying, damn it, that sucks. Uh, but the problem with this is that Ruby 1.8.7 is basically sort of a platypus. You know, it's, it's a combination of two interesting things that is neither of those things in and of themselves. Now these backports are useful, but just the fact that they exist doesn't mean that if you write code on Ruby 1.9, it will work on Ruby 1.8.7. So it doesn't really accomplish that goal. And one thing's for sure, if you care about Ruby 1.8.6 support, how many people use Ruby Enterprise Edition for something? Okay, some of you. Or JRuby. You know, if you care about 186 support and you use even one feature that's new in Ruby 187, your old reliable truck explodes. And this is an interesting problem for project maintainers, for sure. I mean, what it means for me, and I try really hard to review every single patch that comes into any, single pro any project of mine, and I give people feedback whether or not I think I'm going to accept the patch. But what it means for me is before I even try this stuff, I need to visually scan this to see if it includes any of these new features that might break my 186 support. Now, this has happened several times before, so I'm not just you know, speaking about hypotheticals. But a more interesting problem is for packagers on different operating system distributions. How do you decide what to use right now? Are you going to ship with Ruby 187 or 186? Most distributors are using 187 moving forward. I heard completely, I have nothing to back this up, but I think Snow Leopard may have 187. So that means that you will be working in a 187 environment if you use the default system that's in your environment. Now, if you wanted to use 186 right now, I'm sure that people know who are running it you need to go and look for it in the old versions of stuff. You can't just pull it right off the front page of you know, Ruby Lang. And this means that 186, we are resisting change when we use it. And there may be a reason for that, or may not, but we are resisting change when we choose to do that. So when we have a community doing this, and we see the real problems to it, what should authors be doing? I really don't know the answer to this question. I mean, at this point, at the time that I was starting to write this book, and at the time David was writing his book, this is during the time that Ruby 186 was having all of these crazy problems because of those security patches. So it was too unstable, it was too unreliable, and you really hate telling someone in a book, okay, now go ahead and go to this FTP site and go to this particular version and download this exact patch level, because it just sounds terrible. I mean, what kind of message is that to someone who is not familiar with our language? But something like Ruby 187, which you know, for its purposes may have been useful in the sense of being a transitional release, if you cover that, what are you really giving someone? I mean, 
if you talk about that and then you talk about Ruby 1.9, there's still going to be differences. So the only reasonable choice that we had, I guess there is no choice, is to treat Ruby 1.9 as the way forward. And hopefully that actually materializes because it's a big risk to write books in this way. So, you know, this, I believe that Ruby 187 was about giving you a choice, to, saying you can enjoy some of these new features, but you can take your time and decide when you want to move to 1.9, if at all. But it really puts a lot of people between a rock and a hard place. So I really feel at this point that the only choice for us was to you know, take the jump and just say Ruby 1.9 is where it's going to be. And for our legacy apps, we're going to have Ruby 186, but that's sort of like a special you know, separate entity now because they're not cleanly connected together. Now, I wanted to make sure that I checked my time and I'm good on it. This issue, before I go any farther in this talk, I wanted to get at least a little bit of feedback from the audience about your experiences. So anyone who has experience with this sort of decision, whether you're a maintainer, someone who's looking at the language and hasn't really done much yet, whether you're an author, I'd like to hear from you. So let me just take two or three minutes of responses if you guys would like to share. So I'm Eric Hodel. If you don't know me, I maintain uh, Ruby Gems and a lot of stuff. And uh, I think I'm going to start moving away from 186 support because there are just too many versions for me to handle. But this is going to be like, take me more than a year to do, so I'm not moving fast. Eric, do you mean move away from 18 entirely or? Uh, no, one, 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 lots of people still use 187, 186 stuff. And uh, it seems like they've been continuing to backport some stuff from 187 to 186 even. So stuff may still work on 186. I just won't care if it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't care at that point if RDAC and Ruby Gems and things like that break on 186? Correct. Um, those will probably be the last two things that I would drop 186 support for. So are you, are you targeting 187 or 19? 187 and 19. Okay, other sort of thoughts? Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, if you were to write in the syntax of 186 and run it on 187 or 19, it's still going to work. Right? That's, that's correct. So you can still code specifically for 186 without really coding for 186. That's absolutely right. You have to be completely aware of which functions are in 186 and which are in 187. So as long as your reference is for 186, then you're good. That's right. But no, no, no. What, what you're asking is if, if 187 is going to be That's not correct, right? There is 186 code that will break if you move forward to 19. That, most of those issues have been resolved. Oh. It, but that was a very serious issue at first. I mean, that broke Rails and lots of other things. Those, a lot of those incompatible issues have either been resolved or have reasonable workarounds. Who resolved those? Like, no, I mean, did I, I, I mean, well, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I just know that, you know, basically there was this huge, huge fight about, I, I, I guess I started this fight, but. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this huge fight about that particular issue. And everyone in Ruby Core was saying, show us code that isn't compatible. Show us code that isn't compatible. And at the point that that actually happened, people couldn't come up with anything that made sense. So I mean, that's, again. That was even true with 187. And I think that's what the thread was about. Yeah, that's right. 187 is. Exactly. It seems like that issue, which scared a lot of people, is because. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the problem right now, in my eyes, is not necessarily that anything that is bad, but who do you trust in the Ruby world right now in terms of versions? That is not a question that we can answer right now. Yeah, I think also there's a couple of problems that arose, partly because of the version numbering. I mean, like, for instance, people point out correctly that there's code in, say, 185 or whatever that won't run in 186, or code in, you know, 163 that won't run in 165. I mean, in other words, the, up, the tiny number upgrades have always not necessarily run the previous version. Part of the problem is that since they decided not to have a 1.10, a new, there was kind of, and this, you know, the people on the core have said this, that there was a kind of redefinition of what the changing the third digit meant. So going from 186 to 187, just in terms of sheer quantity, as you've shown, is, you know, much 
more significant than any other third digit change has ever been in the history of Ruby. And really, there are those of us who feel that you know, 187 should have been 1.9 and 1.9 should be 2.0 uh, you know, or something like that. And so a lot of it, I think people have been thrown by the fact that going, you know, one minor digit is this really major kind of change. Um, so yeah, a lot of 186 code will run on 187, but as you said before, it, it, it's a less, it, it's just a bigger jump. And so it makes it harder if you've got a development environment where you know, you upgrade your operating system and it's 187 and it's just a bigger kind of gap. Also, just one other thing, the, the fact that 190 was really not kind of production ready and not stable, I think also has, you know, still has kind of ripple effect of making people skittish about 1.9 in general. So right. That was, you know, less of a smooth transition than, than would have been ideal. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons and, and so on for it, but I think 191 in that sense is, you know, it's really important for Yeah, that's a really good point about the 190 issue. How many people tried Ruby 190, you know, a while ago, had some problems and said, oh, wow, this isn't ready. I'm going to come back to this way later. You know, the thing is that if you were in those shoes, you may be thinking that 191 is just a small difference between that. Now, in my experience writing a book, 191 except for the absence of you know, the library support, is definitely ready in the sense that it is much better than it was a year ago. It's something that we can start playing with, that the, the more progressive members of this community can push it forward and library maintainers can push it forward and it could be a good thing. But I mean, that issue is definitely a good point. Now, I'd like to stop this here because it, I think we could probably go on forever with it. But, There'll be, if I have more time for questions at the end, I'd be happy to keep talking about it. So here's another sort of oddity that came up in the projects that I'm working on. Now, in my company that I work for, we mostly deal with Unix, which if you're working with Ruby is great because you know, Ruby has really good support across most of the different you know, POSIX anything distros. You know. So you don't need to worry about much. But occasionally, we need to do stuff on Windows, which is a totally different story. Now, this is just something that I find either hilarious or sad, but I want to share this story. So we're building this API on top of a truck routing software that runs only on Windows and has a C API only on Windows. And we need to be able to interface with basically a DLL and then we're going to wrap this in a service interface. All of that stuff's not that important. Now, one thing that is amazingly awesome right now is that we have a solution that's much better than C extensions. We have FFI. FFI allows you to wrap libraries, C libraries, using pure Ruby. And you don't need to compile anything. And this is supported all over the place. Now, this is like my full sort of presentation application, but if you isolate it down to just the stuff that has to do with the actual functions we were wrapping, now we actually ended up wrapping like 60 functions, but this is a simple example of just opening a connection, closing a, con opening a connection, getting a distance between two points, and then closing the connection. Now, if you look at the C specifications for this, and then the code that we wrote to wrap these functions so that they're directly callable from Ruby, that's the whole thing. That's it. Pure Ruby. We didn't have to think about anything. Now, this library is really cool. I just have a random syntax proposal for it. I would like the signatures to match, and I'd like to do less of this boilerplating. So I've talked to the guys that maintain FFI, and you may be able to do something like this in the future, which is literally point me at a library. This is not just on Windows, by the way. See library anywhere. And in fact, you know, it's mostly not meant for Windows, but it works fine. And you can just wrap an API just by defining its signature. I mean, that's awesome. This works cross-platform on pretty much any operating system that you could imagine. And it works across implementation. Now, this is interesting because it means that if you're using JRuby or Rubinius, and I think MacRuby is working on this, you can use it. It works on MRI and it works on YARV. Now, 
that fixes a big problem because right now if you think about MRI versus ER, if you have a C extension, it doesn't just work when you uh, try to use it on one net. And you know, on these other things, the, on these other libraries, the C extensions don't work either. So if you write an MRI C extension, that's going to run on MRI and MRI only unless you do a lot of hoops that I don't understand. So can anyone guess what we chose to use on Windows as an implementation? Does someone shout out something random? It doesn't really. You. Python. <laughs> I know that the Ruby community has some animosity towards Java, but the funniest and saddest thing in the world is that the easiest way to wrap a C library on Windows <laughs> is with JRuby. <laughs> now, it is theoretically possible to build FFI for, you know, the Matz's Ruby interpreter on Windows, but it's not supported and it's not done. But to use it with JRuby, I installed the JDK and FFI comes with it. I wrote that script that I just showed and I typed JRuby and then the file name and it worked. That was the whole setup. And this is sort of amazing to me. And, you know, seriously, what the fuck? <laughs> so, I'm now going to segue into implementation stuff. Take a look around, man. How many Windows boxes do you see? I think the answer is right here in the audience. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. But if you're using software, like in our case, in fact, we do absolutely no Windows stuff unless we have to. But a client has a requirement for software that they use that only runs on Windows. What are you going to do? We're going to write our own truck running software? I mean, it's just, it's a reality, you know, it's a reality that you need to be able to work in Windows sometimes if you're working on, you know, something that isn't just perfectly your own project. But right now, I promised that I'd talk about implementations, and I have to be honest, it's really hard to summarize this stuff, and it's really hard in the course of a few weeks to give you any sense of what you should be doing with implementations. So I focus more on the stuff that we've talked about so far. And then what I've done in the end here is compiled a list, of, a, a list of the different implementations that I tried out, what was interesting about it, what was sort of scary about it, and what my experiences were. So of course, there's standard Ruby 1.8. And every definition that I make here will be an oversimplification, so I labeled it as such. This is the Ruby that most of us know and love. It's able to run most third-party libraries and legacy code bases, and this is why most of us use it. The exciting thing about this is that everyone in this room is using it. That means that we have a high community base. It's well supported infrastructure wise. It's pretty easy to find a host that has Ruby. It's pretty easy to get Ruby in, in, in the form of MRI pretty much anywhere that you need it. And it's pretty cool that, you know, when we talked about this 191, 187, 186 fiasco, that Engine Yard is taking up support for 186, which means that at least for the foreseeable future, that that will be in good hands so that our old code still runs. So what's concerning? Well, the direction of 187 is controversial, and I think that we've already proved that by the dialogue here so far. And actually, the ubiquity of Ruby 186 MRI may be slowing down other and possibly better implementations of Ruby 18. At this point, JRuby is really damn good, and I have embarrassed to say that just because I said, ill Java, gross, that I didn't even remotely start looking at it until a couple months ago. And it's probably been good for a while. And it's working for the projects that we're using it for. And that's pretty interesting to me. Another issue with MRI is that it likely never be M17N capable. It would require too many changes to do the sort of tricks that they're doing in you know, YARV and the things that are planned for the other implementations. So those are sort of my thoughts about Ruby 1.8 on MRI. So standard Ruby 1.9 is YARV. And the oversimplification here is that it's fast and that it provides the only complete way to have this multilingualization support for Ruby. Now, most of us don't really care about that too much, but there's definitely a demographic which this is important to. And it becomes very obvious why this is there when you consider who the core team is and what sort of problems they face in their work. And if you learn how multilingualization works on Ruby 1.9, it's pretty inspiring. It's pretty interesting. The exciting thing about this is that it's the Ruby of the future. And it's significantly faster than MRI for a lot of things. And it's also a much more solid foundation 
for standard Ruby moving forward to build on top of. This is a much better implementation than what Matt's built. Matt's is a wonderful designer, but he said of himself that you know, Koichi is a better implementer. The concerning thing right now is that the roadmap for Ruby 1.9 is whatever is checked in at any given point, which makes it very hard for other implementers to know what is changing. The Ruby community seems to be divided on whether or not they can put their faith in Yarv. How many of you can say absolutely that you believe that Yarv is the way forward? See? All, all, all the Yarv players raise their hand. Okay, so we're still crossing a language barrier between the core contributors and the Ruby community, which is an issue that I really have no solution for, but it's something that's still there. And this is causing some issues because Ruby 1.9 might be more well-defined if more people were talking between the Japanese and English communities. Okay, so I'm going to blow through these really, really fast. Ruby Enterprise Edition, the oversimplification here is that it improves memory and performance, and it's aimed towards passenger-based servers for Ruby 1.86. The exciting thing about this is that I deploy to it regularly, and I never need to think about it. I don't, I, the first time I ever installed it on my you know, laptop was a few days ago, because every time I deploy the code, I never need to th think about it, which is great. It's extremely easy to work with as well and get set up. And the concerning thing to me about this is that you know, we've actually sharded this and made it a separate implementation, even though it's really just a branch of standard Ruby. And of course, the Windows situation for those uh, unfortunate trend because it doesn't run on Windows, though, I mean, I would say fairly that if you're running Windows server side, there's probably a problem. <laughs> One thing that's super cool, and I've not seen this in anything else, is how friendly this damn installer is for installing Ruby Enterprise Edition. It's sort of like clippy, but not in an annoying way. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really cool. So if you go and install this, it's saying, don't worry, we're not going to screw up your standard Ruby that you have on your computer, answer these questions, and then it even tells you what gems you might need to get things up and running. It's really, really cool. Okay, so JRuby, I've already said a lot about it in this talk, and it's clear that even though a few weeks ago I might have told you, oh, I don't really care about that, it's really interesting. The concerning thing is that in order to use C extensions, you do need to rewrite them for FFI to allow JRuby to access them, which means a great deal of Ruby libraries that depend on C libraries currently aren't working. And it's also still new to us because we haven't looked at it, and that leaves some dark spots uncovered. But this is super cool. It's using a Java library, just directly calling out to it as if it were Ruby, to take HTML and translate it into PDF like this. There's no Ruby wrappers on this. It's just straight calling the Java stuff. That's really cool. Rubius, Rubinius, for now, uh, is dealing with Ruby 1.8.6, and it's following the path of Smalltalk by implementing Ruby in mostly Ruby. And this is really exciting to me, and it has a lot of benefits. I really need to get to a certain point, which is that these guys came up with a lot of the cool stuff. The FFI stuff that you saw came originally from Rubinius. The Ruby spec project comes from Rubinius. Do people know what that is? Uh, who, okay, so that's an attempt to specify all of Ruby using tests. And these tests will document implementation-specific things, version-specific things. It's really quite amazing. And if you go and look at this stuff, it's really easy to work with. Now, Mac Ruby, I think, will be really cool. But to be honest, I'll go through this. I can put my slides up later, and you guys can see my opinions. It doesn't really matter. But there's there's too much hype too early here, and I've had a lot of trouble getting this stuff up and running. I got to this sort of hello world example of making a little button show up on the screen, but that was pretty much as far as I got with it. But I really like the idea. Now, I did do some cool stuff, which I'm not going to show, which is basically I ran the tests and examples and gave my bias judgment on how well something works on Prawn. And you know, basically all of the official stuff worked fine, but JRuby was really impressive to me because I didn't consider it at all. Now, I just want to end with this, which is a teaser. The Ruby spec project is so important because it allows us to communicate across implementations and versions through code. And it tells you what Ruby really is by those specs. And what I would like to do is I'd like to make a web interface so that all of you guys can know exactly where every version on every implementation stands. 
so that you can just type in a method name and see if it works and what the specs were on every implementation. And I plan to do this, and you'll hear more about it from me soon. So please contact me if you're interested in that idea. Thank you. OK, I could take a couple of questions. Can you talk a little about Ruby 1.9 coexisting on a machine 1.8? Because I know that as recently as a couple of weeks ago, the snapshots for 1.9 had their own version number marked as 1.88. If you installed it, you flattened all over all your own libraries for 1.86, etc. How do you set that up? Oh, well, the way that I set it up. Oh, OK, so he asked about how you can have Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9 coexisting peacefully on a machine. The way that I set it up, and it's ridiculous because I do this not just for Ruby but for everything, is that I just keep everything out of my path and only add it when I want it to. And I put it in different places. You know, and it's tedious, it's annoying. You can set up scripts to help with that. And it's just the most surefire way to just know exactly what you're running. And actually, when I did these prawn tests, I was about to report that Rubinius was running as fast as MRI on the prawn examples, which is obviously completely ridiculous because of a mistake like that, you know, where I was running the wrong thing. But generally speaking, if I'm working with explicitly setting paths, that works well for me. I don't rely on prefixes and things like that. What's that? In, in 1.9, there's a config option. You can add a, a, a suffix. Well, what I, say, I tend not to rely on the suffix because I prefer it just to be completely in a separate space so that they don't touch each other. And I set up, I set up an alias that does Ruby 1.9, but I do it through uh, path stuff, basically. Yeah, the, the One Python more? actually has a really nice solution to this problem. It's called a virtual end. Virtual environment. It actually like, installs a symlink to the Python interpreter that you want. Send links to all the libraries that you want and all your code in particular, like so, sort of like a CA group, sort of like, like a jail. And then you never have to worry about what version you're running in a particular spot. If you have more than one version coexisting on a particular machine, I can have three versions of Python, some stack with some, some not, all running on the same machine with no problems. That's very interesting. For somebody to come up with something like that for Ruby. I have one more question. As a follow-up to that, there's a project called Sandbox that, that is trying to do that. I don't know how far along it is, but... Okay, so if you guys are interested in that, check out Sandbox. Okay, so I really would like to continue this discussion. So, you know, hit me up on Twitter. I'm sea creature there for obvious reasons, and, um, or not at all obvious reasons. <laughs> Thank you very much.